Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you Mr. Jeff Chandler in a story taken from life. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents The Case Against Lou Dock, a factual document concerning the San Francisco Tong Wars, starring Mr. Jeff Chandler. Hi, Hap. How's it going? Oh, horrible. If you mean my car, it wastes gas, it's tough to start. Uh-huh, it... yeah. Well, why don't you go straight, Hap? Straight, Sure, Harlow? sure. Straight to your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer for a spark plug checkup. You see, Hap, the spark plugs are the heart of your car's ignition system, and they've got to be right. Now, he's got the exclusive Autolite plug check indicator that tells in an instant whether your spark plugs are right for your style of driving. Well, suppose my plugs only need cleaning. Why, half your Autolite spark plug dealer has the specialized equipment to do the job properly. And if replacements are needed, he'll recommend ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, resistor or standard type, to give you smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. So, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer soon. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with... The Case Against Lou Dock, and the performance of Mr. Jeff Chandler. Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! Lieutenant Sunjack, take your men, go up to the other end of the alleyway. Plan them back in the doorways. It's plenty dark, they won't be seen. I'll do the same done at this end. The signal to move will be a sharp blast of a whistle. You got that? Right. All right, man, you heard the captain. Yeah. Where's the VA? Over there. Oh, yeah. Thompson, huh. Well, looks like I'm right on time. Oh, oh, Glasgow, I'm glad you got here. Yeah, this must be an important one. Looks like the whole San Francisco police force is here. It's a big one, believe me. Oh, you know Captain of Detectives Wilburn? Yeah, yeah, we've met. And this is Lieutenant Sonjak. I'm glad to meet you. Glasgow? The men all have their instructions, D.A. Good. Then take your positions. Okay, men, let's go. All right, Thompson. Yeah. You want to come along with me, Glasgow? Our stakeout's down about midway in the alley. All right, with you. It's a laundry. There's a vacant storeroom upstairs. We can watch it from up there. The uh, message you left for me back at the newspaper office wasn't too explicit, Mr. D.A. Well, tonight's the night we've been waiting for. Uh, more murder and mayhem. Hmm, perhaps. Look, you've arrested hundreds of Chinese before all members of some tongue. What good did it do? Well, none. Just arresting the hatchet man isn't the answer. No, sir. Well, this is it. Smells empty. Chinese laundryman who ran this shop was hacked to death in the last tong battle they held along here. Come along. It's up those stairs. Who's having it out tonight? The Hop Ying Tong and the On Sings. Well? Come Ji Ho and Lu Doc. Yeah. The two most popular and powerful tong leaders. I agree with you as far as Come Ji Ho is concerned, but as for Lu Doc. I'm more determined than ever to get him. This man was a double life, Glasgow. By day, a sweet, smiling, and innocent silk merchant. And by night, a ruthless murder of his countrymen. He won't stop the tongues by convicting Lou Doc. Well, we'll be able to see everything from this window. <sighs> Clear night. Yeah. A million stars in the sky. We stood next to the open window above the laundry shop, fearless District Attorney Red Muchia and I, and we waited. From the window, we could see down into the dimly lit street called Sporford Alley, a narrow street lined on either side with butcher markets, curio shops, tea parlors, and more laundries. In some of those shops, fronts for hidden gambling dens, sultry, air-oppressed opium dens. Lou Doc, the man the D.A. accused of being the most notorious tongue leader in San Francisco, was all of that. But he was more. Lou Doc was my friend. He was a man of principles. Born in San Francisco and wanting to adapt himself to the ways of his Western brothers, he'd learned to speak, read, and write a pronounced English. He'd educated himself in the thoughts and ideas of the Western world. I knew Lou Doc. 
And I had my doubts that he was going to show up in Spofford Alley tonight. Cigarette, Glasgow? Yeah, yeah thanks. What makes you so sure Lou Doc and Kum Ji Ho are going to show tonight? They're bitter enemies. When Kum Ji Ho learned that Lou Doc's brother was in love with one of his favorite sing-song girls, he, he challenged the Hop Yings. What's the girl's name? A toy. She's a dancer at the Golden Lamp. Oh? On surface, the incident is just a spark to ignite the flame, Glasgow. Uh, you know that as well as I do. The real battle is being fought for supremacy. Yeah. Almost 12. Any minute now. We didn't have long to wait. Because at exactly 12 o'clock, a loud, shrill cry rang out at one end of Spofford Alley. And at the other end of the alleyway, the reply. And another full-scale tongue war began. There were at least 50 black-suited Chinese with their plates shoved under dark slouched hats that met head-on in the alley. The hatches reflected the moonlight as they crashed open enemy heads and long, gleaming daggers found their marks in soft, easy flesh. And as the police moved in, they scattered in every direction, stumbling over the dead and wounded. But the police were efficient. They'd hold up both ends of the alley, and it looked like they'd rounded up every one of the Buhau Doi that was alive. The district attorney paced the floor of the storeroom, his hands nervously twisting behind him as he waited for his captain of detectives to report to him. Then we heard heavy steps coming up the stairs. In a few moments, three men appeared at the head of the landing. Captain Wilburn, his lieutenant Sanjak, and a smiling, dark-haired Chinese with his hands tied behind him. The A. Oh, where's the other one? He, uh, he disappeared. What do you mean he disappeared? I don't know, D.A. He was in mixing it up with the rest of them. I know, I saw him. But after we had the rest of them rounded up, I couldn't find him. How did you know it was Lou Doc, Captain? The big head. I recognize his big head. You can't accuse a man because... Bring that other one over here. Okay. You, move. This is the one they call Kum Ji Ho. I know why you started this one, Kum Ji Ho. Oh, yes. How did Lou Doc manage to escape? Oh, yes. Lou Doc. Very fine silk merchant, yes. Don't stall with me. It'll go a lot easier on you. You know you're not going to get this man to talk. We'll see about that. Now, I want the names of every Bu Hao Doi that fought in the alley tonight. Chang Talo. Diyang. What was that? <laughs> I think he said he wants his lawyer before he speaks another word. Correct. A lawyer? Yes. Thank you. Well, I never heard it of looks any... Looks like tonight wasn't the night you thought it was going to be, D.A., I'm afraid your net results are zero. District Attorney Muchia wasn't going to get Kum Ji Ho to inform on Lou Doc, no matter how hard he tried. For a Tong member to testify or inform on another, even your most hated enemy, which was a rival Tong, was certain death. And in most cases, members of your own tongue would carry out the death sentence. In the wild confusion of that battle, it would have been impossible to tell whether Lou Doc had taken part in it. Captain of Detectives sworn he'd seen him. I wanted to know for sure, so the following morning I went to his house of business. A little old Chinese sitting behind the counter didn't even glance up at me as I entered. I walked over to the door of Lou's office and knocked. A voice yelled, enter in Chinese, and I did. I opened the door. Seated behind a bleached rattan desk sat the man with his big head, rocking back and forth. Lou Doc. Hello, Dan. It is nice to see you again. It's nice to see you. Please to sit. I was just about to serve tea. Thanks. Oh, I beg your pardon. This Dan is my beloved brother, Tommy. Mr. Dan Glasgow of San Francisco Tribune. How do you do, Mr. Glasgow? Hello, Tommy. You take tea with lemon, I believe. Right. I am most happy of this surprise visit, then. Ah, here you are. Thanks. Ah, most delicious. There were seven men killed in last night's Tong War, Lou Doc. Tell me, Dan, do you prefer the Chinese or Indian tea? I said seven men were killed in last night's Tong battle. Tommy. 
Ula ma on niha. Tio. What's the matter? My word's too strong for your brother's sensitive ears? Dan, if you were not a true friend, I would easily kill you with my own hand for such a remark. I'm sorry, Lutak. You, as I, believe in righteous principles. It was upon this discovery that I grow very fond of you. I've honored our friendship. In the ways of your Western world are many things that my people do not understand. Among my people are certain things which the Occidental does not understand. But cold-blooded murder is not a way that either world should have to understand. True. But I have read in the Western world books, I read of organization called California Vigilance Committee. Oh, look, that committee is to protect the innocent from the guilty. Yes, no argument, but for the protection. In Hap Ying Tong is protection for my people. Now comes time when most beloved brother falls in love with a sing-song girl named Atoy. He wishes to marry with her. She returns this love. It must be so. And, and so, in order to bring about this marriage, hundreds of men may lose their lives. If it is as the gods design, yes. There's nothing that I can say that can convince you to settle the whole thing peaceably? In China, perhaps by tribunal, but in San Francisco, then, it is not probable. We must settle this difference by other means. Oh, and I'm sorry, Lou Doc. I'm sorry for your people. There is no one upon whose heart this sorrow hangs heavier. And with that, Lou Doc rose up from his chair. Stood staring at me for a moment through tear-filled eyes. Then he turned and strode majestically out of the room, his large head bent as if in prayer. In the weeks that followed, for some unknown reason or other, the town wars slowed down to practically a standstill. It had been only a couple of hatchet murders in two months. Oh, it seemed almost too good to be true. And then, on January 4th, I received a phone call from the DA's office about four in the afternoon. His voice had a smile in it. Well, it took someone else to do it, Glasgow, but it was done. What was done? About an hour ago in Ross Alley, two Tong men shot a man and then hacked his face to ribbons with their hatchets. When Captain Wilburn got down there, he identified the man. Who was it? The man we've been after. Your good friend, Lou Doc. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Jeff Chandler in The Case Against Lou Doc. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, just what does ignition engineered mean? Well, Hap, it means that Autolite spark plugs are tops in quality and performance. That's because they're designed by the same Autolite engineers who designed the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts that make up complete ignition systems used as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. Well, that's a pretty good reason to use them, Harlow. It's the best, Hap. So have your Autolite spark plug dealer replace worn-out spark plugs with either standard or resistor-type Autolite spark plugs for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. They just don't come any better than Autolite. Autolite spark plug dealers offer the best spark plug service money can buy, too, Harlow. Right you are, Hap. So, friends, to quickly learn his address, call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. She'll gladly tell you the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember... From bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Jeff Chandler in Elliot Lewis's production of The Case Against Lou Doc, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. Lou Doc had been my friend, and the realization of what an impact his death would have on his following hit me. It was to be a great loss for them. 
I hung up the phone and decided to go down to the police station. When I got there, the desk sergeant lifted a tired finger and told me that Captain Wilburn was back in the morgue with Lieutenant Sonjak. Come in, Glasgow. The DA said you might be down. So you finally got Lou Doc. Yeah, we didn't. It was a couple of rival tongmen that did the job. Did you pick him up? No. Nope. Uh, got away. Want to take a look at him? The bloody. Yeah. Over here. All right, son, Jack. Turn down the sheet. Oh, no. See what I mean when I say bloody? His face. His own mother wouldn't recognize him. How do you know it's Lou Doc? By the head. Take a look at the head. What's left of it? Doc had a big head, almost out of proportion to the rest of his body. That's how I know it's him. But still, look, I... Look, Glasgow, the DA's told me how you feel about this guy. I don't want any trouble from you. This man is Lou Doc. I positively identify him as the notorious tongue leader of the Hop Yings. Do you care to challenge that statement? Mm, no. No, of course not. Then you will admit this is Lou Doc. Sure, Captain, I admit it. That's Lou Doc. I admitted it because the thought suddenly occurred to me that here was the opportunity I'd been waiting for. The dead man lying on the slab in the police morgue was not Lou Doc. The police had no positive identification as to who the man was, but it looked like a perfect way to ease the pressure that was being brought to bear on them. Captain Wilburn knew that faceless man was not Lou Doc as well as I did. The following morning, I went to the business house of Lou Doc, the silk merchant. Just as I'd expected, the name on the door had been changed. Next door was a gambling parlor. I gave the password at the door and was admitted. I sat down at one of the fantan tables and began playing. I hadn't been playing long when I suddenly felt the presence of someone familiar standing next to me. Three. Sheep. Hello, Lou Doc. Hello, Dan. Happy to meet with you. Is there somewhere we can talk? Come. Owner of this establishment is a good friend of mine. We shall use his office. All right, you lead the way. Come. In here. Now, we are alone. <laughs> you're still hale and hearty, even though you're dead. That is not a good joke. I take it you read the morning papers. Oh, yes. In time to change the name on your place of business. You were pleased to see elimination of Ludak, weren't you, my friend? You want the truth? Our most precious bond, Dan. Yes, Ludak, I was, because now it's no longer necessary for you to work with any tongue. It surprises me that you, of all persons I respect, should think that way. There's great work yet to be done among my people. Forget the work, Lou. It's a battle that won't be won until every tongue is disbanded. And if I leave, what then? Kumjiho and his tongue take over leadership in San Francisco. The terror that exists now will seem, my friend, a mere particle. Well, what about the police? The police are satisfied, you know that. The notoriety and publicity that have gone before will no longer continue to follow me. The Hop Yings will continue to exist and you still behind them. Yes, my friend, to make decisions. I will set up puppet leader. But their rival, Kumji Ho, will always know that still sitting on the throne of the Hop Yings is Ludak, the man he fears. I'm a newspaper man. I have to print the truth. You know that. Yes, my friend, I know. I also know something else. You yeah. I also know Dan Glasgow. You are a true friend of Ludak. And he was right. I knew the fight within myself had begun. To know that he was still alive and yet never to print that fact. Because in doing so, I'd have to betray his friendship. A windy night in February, I was working late in the office. It was about 8 o'clock when one of the reporters came in and told me that Tommy Yu Shu, Lou Doc's brother, had been trapped in the cafe of his dancer girlfriend, Art Toy. I rushed down to Dagger Alley. There wasn't a soul in sight. 
I started to walk. It was cold and heavy wind was blowing, but my hands were soaking wet with perspiration as I made my way up the cobblestone walk to the golden lamp. I imagined a hundred eyes staring at me from dark doorways. Then I was in front of the cafe. I walked up to the door. It was bolted. Tommy. Tommy, you shoo. It's me, the newspaper man, Dan Glasgow. Let me in. Let me in, Tommy. Hurry, hurry. Thanks. What are you doing here? Word leaked out. The Onsings had you hold up here. They sure do. You took an awful chance coming up that alleyway. Well, why'd you risk your neck here for coming here? A toy, Mr. Glasgow. Oh, I see. We planned to leave tonight. Secretly. Somehow they learned of our plans. It was our toy's father who betrayed us. Her father? Please, Tommy. My father was threatened. There was nothing he could do. I'm willing to die with Tommy. Does Lou Doc know you're here? No. Then call him. Tell him to call the police. You have talked with my brother, Mr. Glasgow. You know he would never do that. But you'll never get out of here alive. Then it must be so. Oh, I, I don't understand it. You'd be willing to commit suicide because of some silly, superstitious, and clannish idea that, that the only way to deal out justice is through force. Well, you and your brother and everybody who thinks that way, Tommy, are wrong. Maybe the idea of tongues originally were good ideas, but, but the goodness has gone out of them. I'm going to call the police. One moment, Mr. Glasgow. I'm sorry, but I cannot allow you to do that. All right, Tommy, you can put away the gun. I won't call him. Can I call your brother? Perhaps that is best. Thanks. Tommy gave me a number to call. Lou Doc answered the phone himself. His voice remained strangely calm when I told him what the situation was. He told me he was coming right down, warned me to stay in the cafe. Then I hung up. The three of us, Tommy Yushu, the sing-song girl, Art Toy, and myself, sat down and waited. Twenty minutes later, I heard a car screech to a halt down at the end of Dagger Alley. I opened one of the small windows, stuck my head out, and looked down the narrow street. A long black car was parked at the curb. Then the car door opened and Lou Doc stepped out, alone. And he began his long walk up the cobblestones to the cafe. He walked slowly, staring straight ahead. His body firm, rigid, in one position. It was just the movement of his legs. Wearing a long black coat, he looked like a giant as he took long strides, holding his oversized head high. Lou. Hello, Don. You better get inside. There must be at least 25 of them out there. I'm all right. Tell Tommy to come out. But, Dan. Lou, you, you don't have a chance. They won't attack me. They haven't the nerve. Tell Tommy to come up. Tommy, he wants you to go with him. Tommy. I've got to go, Artois. But I'll be back later. <laughs> Do not fear, my baby. Tell him to one. hurry, Dan. Tommy. I'm going. Hello, my brother. And good you. Good to see you. Goodbye, Dan. I see you soon again. Soon, Ludak. The two of them began their long walk back to the end of Dagger Alley. Ludak's hand closed tightly around his brother's arm, walking slowly but steadily toward the black car. They weren't ten feet from it when from out of one of the dark doorways a figure jumped into view. It was Kum Ji Ho. Kum Ji Ho let go with four wild shots. Lou Doc whirled, covering his brother at the same time whipping out a gun and firing. Tommy opened the door of the car, got in and started it up. Then Lou Doc fell to his knees, still firing. Tommy gunned the car away. Lou Doc pitched forward on his face, emptying his gun. Kum Ji Ho dropped to the pavement, clawing at his bloody face. He twitched for just a moment. And then he lay still. When I got to Lou Doc, he was still alive but bleeding badly. He looked up at me. Much pain, my friend. 
much pain. Uh, there'll be an ambulance any minute now, Lou. Just, just hold on. This is not death I prayed my ancestor to give me, Dan. I die lying on wet pavement in dark alley at night. My wounds bleed frill. <laughs> Lou, you, you're not gonna die, Lou. Our most precious bond, truth, in our friendship. Promise me. Promise as you hold me in your arms, my friend, that in stories that will be written in, in one of them, someone will write. So, someone will, will write that we need Beneath the cloak of the legend of his notorious reputation, there existed a man who believed in the principles of righteousness for all his fellow men. Who is there who can sit in judgment and proclaim that there was any case but goodness against the man named Lou Duck. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Jeff Chandler. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. During the early months of 1952, the Autolite family will join together in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment right on their assembly lines. Our Autolite family is made up of the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast, and in still other Autolite plants in many foreign countries. Our family also includes more than 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as 96,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. The Autolite family will have the privilege of saluting the Plymouth Division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense on television so that you won't miss this program. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, our star will be the first lady of suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead, as Lizzie Borden, in a dramatization of the most famous unsolved American murder mystery. A true story we call The Fall River Tragedy. In weeks to come, we shall also present Mr. Clifton Webb, Mr. Charles Boyer, and Mr. J. Carroll Nash. All on... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Case Against Lou Doc was written for Suspense by Richard George Pettuccini. In tonight's story, William Conrad was heard as Lou Doc and Joseph Kearns as Muccio. Featured in the cast were Lillian Bioff, Sam Edwards, Herb Butterfield, Byron Kane, and Jack Crucian. Jeff Chandler can now be seen in The Flame of Araby, a universal international Technicolor production co-starring Maureen O'Hara. And remember next week, the first lady of suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead, as Lizzie Borden in The Fall River Tragedy. This is the CBS Radio Network.